Good morning. Good morning. Oh, nice. I love it. Excellent. Way to engage. I appreciate that. I love seeing these kids run. I love seeing kids run, you know, go in there excited about the great, just the great programming we have for kids here at, at Centerpoint. And it just reminds me that it takes a village to raise a child. You know what I'm saying? It takes a village to raise a child. And I remember when I was thinking about it, my, my, when I used to have my kids hold my fingers when they were young, you know, when they were walking, like when they were really, you remember doing this, you're walking like this and the kid, you're walking with them. And just growing up a child is amazing. And then I remember this story of this friend of mine who, who had a little child and she was teaching and growing this kid and trying to get this kid to walk. And she was so focused on getting this child to walk. But at one point, she actually had a commitment outside of the home, so she had to leave. And so she gave, she, she said to her friend, who actually I know also, I know the friend, and said, hey, could you just watch my child for just this little moment here, because uh, I gotta go do this thing just for a couple hours, whatever. But she made sure to make this note. She said, here's the deal. I'm trying to get him to walk, okay? But I don't want you to, I know everybody wants to train people to walk. I don't want you to do it because I don't want you to have them walk with you first. As a parent, this is my job, right? Like she, she really wanted to have that child. And so um, the story goes that they're sitting there in a the, the couple hours, your babysitting, and this child is sitting there and they're in the carpet. They're sort of in this living room area. And the child's on, you know, already like this, walking around on the table, right, on the coffee table. And the child, <clears throat> while she's being babysat, does this. Stands up like this. And immediately, she took notice. The babysitter took notice. And then she goes and takes another step. And right as she planted it, you know how they're wobbly? Right as she planted it, she pushed her down. <laughs> she, she literally, whoa! It didn't happen. It didn't happen. <laughs> and I don't know why I thought of that story, but I just thought that was funny. You know, we, uh, we, 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 as a community, we grow people, right? As, as a community, we grow people. We're talking about becoming. And really, you know, that's the story of becoming. We see it physically happening all around us. People coming around people to help people become working adults. We help people, you know, balance their checkbook, help them understand about budgets, help them to drive a car, you know, teaching your teenagers to drive a car. And it's so funny because, like, you know, when you're kids, you, when, you, when they're kids, you want to train them and teach them to, to walk and talk. But when they're teenagers, you want them to sit down and shut up, right? It's like a complete reversal of what happens but that's becoming, but we're not talking about that kind of becoming. We're talking about the kind of becoming that happens inside of a person. The kind of becoming that happens inside of a human being where God is working and God is knocking on the heart of your soul. It doesn't matter whether you believe him or not. If you're here for the first time or have only been showed up for the last six months or two Sundays or whatever it is, thanks for coming, number one. But we're talking about God's work. And God really does want to connect with you deeply. And this is the idea. This is what we're talking about when we say becoming. We're talking and we're using the backdrop of, of Joshua. An amazing leader in the story of Israel, this, this backdrop of this story, we're using Joshua. And today we're going to read a story, and I'm going to have to run through this really quickly. So strap on your seatbelts and extinguish all smoking material, because we're going to get after this thing. But this is a tragic story. I just need to start with that right off the bat. This story is a tragic story in Joshua's leadership in the first little bits of his leadership because we basically left off with him crossing the Jordan the 12 stones we're going to bypass Jericho which was an amazing success Jericho was an unbelievable success they didn't even have to raise a spear in order to conquer that city but we're into the next story which is the story of AI where actually Joshua is going to conquer the next city after this tremendous success with Jericho, the story of Ai, and it's a tragic story. I just, I'm, I just need you to get brace yourself for this because it's going to grind against a lot of our humanity, especially, especially here in the United States of America, 
it is going to just grind against the way that we've been brought up and the way that we think. Let's jump into this story. I'm just going to read you some portions of the scripture of this story really quick. So follow with me. You ready? Here we go. In verse 2 of chapter 7, Joshua sent the men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth Aben, east of Bethel, and he said to them, go up, spy out the land. It's the same thing they did with Jericho. It's the same thing when they went into the promised land. Go and spy, and they went, and they sent up men to Ai. And they returned to Joshua, and they said to him, do not have all the people go up, but let only two to 3,000 go up and attack. In other words, we don't need the whole deal. You may remember I said to you that at this point in time, there was about 600,000 foot soldiers in the nation. They said, we don't need everybody, just two or 3,000 people. Do not make the whole people toil up there for there are very few. Plus, hey, we had great success in Jericho. Don't worry about it. Verse four, so about 3,000 men went up from the people and they fled. Israel fled from before the men of Ai and the men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Shabarim and struck them in, in, the, in the descent and the hearts of the people melted and became like water. 36 fathers 36 husbands, 36 brothers, uncles, 36 men of war died. And the hearts of people melted. Why did it melt? You have to go back to Leviticus 26 to really understand this. And I don't have time to read through the whole portion of scripture. But in Leviticus 26, which they're going to put up here right here, there's a key verse. Notice what it says in verse 5. It says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and all your mind. You shall love. But actually it says this. In verse, in verse 7 it says this. You shall chase your enemies and they shall fall before you by the sword. Five of you shall chase a hundred. Listen. Five of you shall chase a hundred. This is verse eight. Five of you shall chase a hundred and a hundred of you shall chase a thousand. There's a blessing and a curse that God put into place back in Leviticus 26 at Mount Sinai. And the people knew that something was wrong. The nation of Israel, their hearts melted because they knew something was wrong. They probably in their minds went back to these verses in Leviticus and said, We're, something's going on. See, what you have to understand is becoming is a community event. It's not an individual thing. It's not always an individual thing. Becoming is a community event. And so 36 fathers, sons, husbands died. What's the reaction? They melted. But let's see what Joshua's reaction is in the middle of this. In verse 6, it says this. And then Joshua tore his clothes and fell on the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders. And they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, alas, O Lord, why have you brought us these people over Jordan all to give us up into the hands of the Amorites and to destroy us? Would that we had been content to dwell on the other side of the river. Basically, what did you do? You brought us here to kill us? Why did you do this? Why are people dying? You told me, be strong and courageous, and now people are dying. He's tearing his clothes. He's like, we would have been fine living on, there was great real estate on the, where we were before. There's this in, incredible struggle. There's an incredible sensitivity by everybody because becoming is a community event. The next thing we hear is God's response in verse 10. And the Lord said to Joshua, get up, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. 
They, notice, plural. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put them among their, among their own belongings. Notice the plurality of what's happening here. Notice the plurality of what is happening here. Israel has sinned. This is why there's an issue. I'm gonna fast forward to the story. All of a sudden, here we go. What happens is that Joshua, God says to Joshua, get, get up. Why are you all weeping and wailing and breaking your clothes? The clothes had nothing to do with this. Why you got all this thing, dirt on your face and the whole nine yards? Hey, listen, Israel has sinned. So basically what they do, how do they figure this out? Bottom line, they go through the entire nation of Israel. Mind you, there's about 3 million people. And they use this thing that God used back in those days called the casting of the lots. And so they, the elders and Joshua sat in the middle of 3 million people and said, okay, we got 12 tribes. They cast the lots. It's this tribe. Then they went into this tribe. Then they cast the louts and found out what clan, it lays it out in scripture, what clan, what household, what man, what person, until they get down to this one dude. Three million people. There's this whole process that they go through where God is guiding them in casting of the lots and it comes all the way down to this one person. This guy's name is Achan. And Joshua stands before him and says, confess, confess now. Confess before the Lord what the situation is. And he confesses. He says, I took devoted things. Where did he take it from? Jericho. Everything that was supposed to be in Jericho was supposed to stay there. Really, Jericho, a pile of rocks and everything in there, as an altar, everything that was to be belonged to God. But this dude went through, grabbed some gold, grabbed some silver, grabbed some stuff, and went and hid it. And so we pick up the story. Let me just read here in verse 22 in Joshua. And it says this. So Joshua sent men, messengers, and they ran to the tent. And behold, it was hidden in the tent with the silver underneath. And they took them out of the tent. Three million people are involved in this. The whole nation knows. He sends men, they go all the way through a, the, the city of three million people. They find his tent. They dig below his tent. They grab the gold, they grab the silver, and they laid it down before the Lord. Verse 24, and Joshua and all of Israel took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver, and the cloak, and the bar of gold. Listen very carefully to this. And his sons... And daughters, and the oxen and donkeys and sheep and his tent and all that he had. And they brought them down to the valley of Echo. And Joshua said, why did you bring trouble on us? For the Lord brings trouble to you today. And all Israel stoned him and burned them, sons and daughters, the whole family. And stoned them, and they raised over him a great heap that remains until this day. What's curious, though, what's curious, though, is that when God identifies this sin, notice what he says. I'm going to go backwards here, backwards to verse 10. The Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. Three million people have sinned. They, the nation, have transgressed my commandments and I command them. But what's curious is that when you boil the whole thing down, when you boil the whole thing down, what do you find? You find that God is not looking at it singularly. 
He's not looking at Achan alone. Yes, he paid for it with his life, but so did his children who may or may not have known anything about this. But God struck down 36 other people, husbands, fathers, brothers, uncles, 36 other people died because Israel sinned. Not because Achan sinned. Which teaches us an unbelievable lesson. If you look through scripture, you will find this. You will even find this in the Shema, which we read last week. In Deuteronomy 6, in Deuteronomy 6, it says this, Hear, O Israel. Notice the plurality. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. This is not, this is not a once in a, God always views the community as a whole. This grinds against us in the United States. We are so singular based. It's not my fault. It's their fault. No, no, no. In the sports world itself, it's always about glorifying the one person. Right? It's always about glorifying the one person. That's why New England right now has two teams, right? We have the Patriots and Tom Brady down there in Florida. That's our team too because we own him. <laughs> right? Because that's the way we are in our mentality. We raise people singularly. God doesn't look at it that way. <clears throat> it's a community event. Becoming is a community event. And throughout Scripture, if you read New Testament, Old Testament, we'll get there in a minute, it's, you, it's, it's one body. You go through that. You go, listen, just go back to the wilderness. When the budding, when, the, when, when they did this leadership situation with, the, with the Aaron's budding rod, 15,000 people died in that plague. When the bronze serpent came up, thousands of people died in the middle of that. When Moses was at the bottom of the promised land and they sent 12 spies in, 12 of them came back, two said, Go. 10 said no, a whole generation died because of that decision. It's communal. Becoming is a community event, but more importantly, let me say this. Community is the garden that we grow in. Community is is the garden that we grow in. What's curious about a garden is that it's not just dirt. It's dirty. It's dirt. But in order for it to be healthy, it requires fertilizer. It requires crap. I mean, it's an ugly... Community can get really ugly. But community is the garden that we grow in. This grinds against us so much because we, we can't see ourselves tied to somebody else. But let me assure you, this is like a tandem bike ride. Whatever happens to one, happens to the other. There might be one person driving the tandem, but if that person messes up, that person's gonna pay for it. If this person's in the back sitting there doing this on a tandem bike ride, the person up front is not going to, hey, stop it. Our lives are interconnected. Our growth is interconnected. Our ability to accomplish the mission which God gave us is all interconnected. We need each other. Look around this audience for a minute. Just look around. Because we need, we were made to be deeply interconnected in this community. Look around. This is the people right here. I know some of you are going, holy cow, I can't believe I'm sitting with these people. <laughs> really? I need that person in my life? 
believe me, I know what you're saying. I'm looking at you right now thinking the same thing. I mean, I can't believe God put me here. I can't believe I need that person in my life. That person's got nothing. God's saying, no, no, no. Community is a garden you grow in, Nate. See, we in the United States think that our personal walk, we think that our walk is a, our personal journey, our spiritual experience is a private matter. Our spiritual journey is a private, no, it's not a private matter. Our spiritual walk is not a private matter. It's very personal because it's not a religion. It's a relationship that is between me and God the Father, but that relationship lives within a community. It's not meant to be lived in private. It's not my spiritual life. It's our spiritual life. God makes this very clear. When you look through Scripture, he lays this out and says, Israel has sinned. Turns out it was one dude. But because of that one dude, the whole nation was weeping. Their hearts were melting. Joshua is on the floor ripping his clothes, putting dirt in his face because he feels the intensity of the fact that something is wrong in the community. Spirituality our spiritual journey is meant to be lived in community. It is designed. Listen, let this, let this quote settle here for just a minute. Your spiritual journey is designed to be lived in community. Let me say it to you differently. If this carpet right here represents community, and you try to live outside of this, and I'm doing like this, for those of you online, because I know this is like the great divider right here. If you, if you are outside of this, your ability to grow spiritually, to maximize the growth that God has for you is mitigated. You cannot grow to your max potential outside of community. It's impossible. You're going against the design of what God has put in that place. Your spiritual journey is designed. You are designed. We are interlocking tinker toys that come together to build something. That's why we need each other. This is a community. And, and God put this awful, unbelievably tragic story in the middle of Joshua at the beginning to express to that nation, don't forget that we rise and we fall together. Together. The way that I view you, God says, is together, not individually. Well, that opens up an amazing series of questions. That's like a mind-blowing concept where all of a sudden you start looking around this audience and you start going, holy cow. Like these people are going to invest in me. I have to invest in them. And, and, and we have to grow together. Yes, that's exactly right. Community is the garden. Community is the garden we grow in. And gardens are full of dirt. They're full of crap. They're full of all this multi-yuckiness that is just on. Sometimes we just don't like to get our hands dirty. Now, some of you might be going, Nathan, I hear you. I understand what you're saying. But I see this. This is Israel. This is not today. 100% false. That concept is universal across time. I wish I had, I wish I had two months to go through this alone because I could lay out in scripture and show you all this, but I just don't have that time. So you're going to have to go and read. I'm going to read a couple verses here <clears throat> from 1 Corinthians 12. But for those of you who are looking for your gold star this week, go read 1 Corinthians 12 as a complete unit. But let me just read to you 1 Corinthians 12, starting in verse 12. 1 Corinthians 12, 12, it says this. For just as the body is one and has many members, but it's one body, many members, one body. And all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews and Greeks, Anybody, slaves, free, doesn't matter. 
all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of individual members, but of many. It doesn't consist of one. It doesn't consist of individual members. It's connected. Because the spiritual, the spiritual journey is designed to be lived. The master blueprint that God put forth, there is design in the intricacy of the body. Listen to these next verses in Corinthians. This is later on in the chapter, verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need for you, nor again the head to the feet. This is New Testament for those of you who are unaware. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need for you, nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And all those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with great modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God designed. But God has composed the body. We are his symphony. Or we're clattering cymbals. We are his symphony, my friends. So God has composed the body, giving greater honor to the parts of the body that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may be, may have the same care for one another. Listen, 26. If one member suffers, all suffer together. Does that at all resonate with Joshua chapter 7? If one member suffers, all members suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Why is this? Community is the garden that we grow in. Community is the garden that we grow in. Our journey, our spiritual journey is designed to be in community. We are interlocked together. What you do as a body affects me. What I do affects you. We are one. Now, if you're here <clears throat> for the first time or you're here online and you're listening in and this is not your regular place or you're, not, you're here and we're excited that you're here, thank you for being here. We, you honor us with your presence. But for just a moment, I need to have a little family co conversation here. And I prayed about this. We just need to have a little conversation here. <clears throat> if you've only been coming here or only aware of us maybe in the last, you know, eight to 10 months, 12 months, for just a moment here, just put your brain on pause for a second. I want to talk to anybody who's been around here for longer than that. And I just want to say this. We are connected. And it's no mystery to anybody that over the last two years, it's been tough. We've had a lot of unforeseen events happen. We've had a lot of things go on in this church Frankly, I'm speaking for myself at this point. I think our garden needs some nutrients. I think we need to understand that we're interconnected here, that we're coming together. And there's all these contextual things that make us go, what's going on? But we know this. The body ain't healthy. And let me just say this. Church is not a building. Church is a group of people. And we need to bring health back into this space. 
What does that look like? It looks like mixing manure with dirt. It means I need you. It means you need me. It means we're interlocked and connected. We gotta walk together. Is it gonna be easy? No, but is it gonna be amazing? Yes. We have, we have a kitchen, kitchen talk conversation coming up again here on Wednesday. You need to be there. You say, I'm busy. I know what busy looks like. There's no way that we can do what God has called us to do unless we come together. And that means it's gonna be difficult, friends. I don't know how it is in your family, but every once in a while in my family, we have to hold each other accountable. Every time in my family, I have to come up with a word of encouragement. I have to say something positive to somebody. Sometimes I have to say something, hey, listen, I think this needs to change. Sometimes people are gonna come up to me and say, this needs to change. I've been having such conversations inside this body. Has everything gone the way that I think it should have gone over the last two years? The answer is no. But I didn't run out the door to go somewhere else. Because I understand that this body is here for a purpose. And I've been having conversations and I'm walking with people. And guess what? It's not, it's not my fault. It's not your fault. It's not the staff's fault. It's not the elder's fault. It's not our lead pastor's fault. It's our fault. So take the, take the U.S. mentality of individualism out of this because God looks at us as a unit. And I feel like God has called us to do something. And so let me just read this portion of scripture to us as we end. This is Paul again in Ephesians. He says this, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy and worthy of a calling. When you're on a call, that means when you're on a calling, when you're on a mission, that means there's gonna be times when we all don't agree, when we all have to work together, when we all have to discern and pray what God has in our life. And it's not always beautiful. But in the middle of that, walk worthy of the calling to which you have been called with humility. That means when I have conversations, I need to walk in with humility and gentleness and patience. Patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Not maintaining artificial peace, but maintaining the peace that passes all understanding because we are his symphony. There is one body, verse four, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. The one hope, we're all headed towards one thing, your hope, one call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and is all in all. Our spiritual journey is meant to be lived in community. So we need to get involved. We don't sit on the side waiting for somebody to do something because we might be waiting for you. So get involved. Get involved in the small groups. Get involved with the children's ministry. Get involved in volunteering. Do the women's ministry. Do the men's ministry. Get involved. Get activated. Come to the Wednesday kitchen night table session that we're having, Wednesday night. Come to that. Be a part. Involve. Get your voice in the conversation. Love, humility, gentleness, bonding of peace. And let God, let God, let God do his thing through us. Let him create beautiful music through the symphony that is the church, which is not a building, but is a body that God placed here to do something amazing that you are a part of. I hope you'll join me. 
I'm not promising an easy path, but I'm promising you a path that God has called us to, which I think is a life worth living. Thank you so much for those of you who are here for the first time or been involved with this just recently. Thanks for letting me have a little conversation with my family. For those of you who are family, man, if you want to talk, I love to talk. You want to pray? Come forward here and pray. You want to talk to an elder? There'll be an elder up here to pray and talk with you too. We would love to do this together because all of us coming together create a symphony that leads everybody's gaze towards the one who made it all happen, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for being a part of this. I appreciate you and I love you each and every single one of you, and I need you. Thank you so much. You are dismissed.